Okay, I, uh, I hope we're live on all of our streaming platforms. Uh, I don't know if we're on Twitch, so maybe not that one. But uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to Lima, Lima Platoon Demo Day and Graduation. I'm Rod Levy, I'm the Executive Director uh, and Founder of Code Platoon. And uh, this is Code Platoon's 12th session. And with this cohort, we'll have prepared over 120 veterans and military spouses to become professional software developers. Before we start, I'd like to give special thanks to sponsor companies, JP Morgan Chase, DRW, Granger. These companies support us financially, and more importantly, they commit to host a Code Platoon graduate for a paid internship. They're truly the secret sauce of Code Platoon. I also want to thank our volunteer teaching assistants, our volunteer mentors, and board members. I'd have you all stand up, but uh, given the circumstances, we'll have to wait for a different time. Their tireless efforts help distinguish Code Platoon from all of the for-profit coding bootcamps and help make us one of the elite coding bootcamps in this country. For those of you new to Code Platoon, a little bit about our program. We are a nonprofit coding bootcamp for the military community. Our grueling 14-week immersive program trains deeply interested veterans, active duty, and military spouses to become professional software developers. We started our first cohort in 2016 with one cohort that year. And now we're graduating our 12th cohort and we offer in-person, remote and part-time programs throughout the year. Our vision is to make coding jobs accessible to the military community through high quality curriculum, generous scholarships and internships. Now, what you've all been waiting for, you will get to see the final team projects of our graduates that they've built over the last two weeks. So I will hand it over to the Coastal Reporter team. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Wall. Uh, and on behalf of our team, uh, my teammate, uh, Kobe Lusky, and myself, we're going to present our application, Coastal Reporter. Quick background on both Kobe and I. We are the gray beards of this class, We've both been around the block a few times. But if you'll see, we've both been involved with applying technological solutions to tackle a variety of environmental uh, challenges. And, and we wanted to build on that, um, and so we, that's what, what led us to this project, and we're actually intending to keep this project going beyond uh, class and graduation here uh, and take it on and, and run it as a continuing ongoing business when we get out. So what's the problem we're working on? There are a lot of conservation groups out there that just don't have an easy way to interact with the public who is trying to help them out with information. Similarly, the citizens who are out there walking the beaches and shorelines don't have an easy way to submit information to those organizations. There's, there's challenges with the amount of staff. If you have a hotline that you're often gonna get voice reports that are confusing or inaccurate. You can use social media, but there's just a lot of noise uh, on that that really is distracting from the mission. There are mobile apps that can do this, but those are expensive. They take resources to keep up and running. And they also introduce a barrier to use. If you don't have the app, you can't take part. That's a really uh, big disincentive. So our solution is let users submit reports just using a text message, a simple SMS text message from whatever kind of mobile phone they've got. We've got basically three populations taking part in touching the system. The first are the citizens who, again, are out walking along the shores, and, and beaches of the, of the country. The second group are largely a lot of non-governmental, non-profit organizations dedicated to wildlife conservation uh, and, and a variety of causes like that. And then the third are the, the active members of that, those organizations who go out and try and remediate what, what might be happening. Uh, and so this is designed to, to connect all three of those. The use case we're focusing on today is for turtles and turtle conservation. The workflow is pretty straightforward. The user's out on the beach. They got their smartphone with them. They see something going on, a stranded turtle, an injured turtle. They'll take a picture. They can attach an optional text description and then they just hit, they just hit send. We're using SignalWire, which is a text processing service to take the, the text message in. It passes it on to our server where we pull off location information from it. We, we store all the information in a database. We send a quick acknowledgement back to the user that we received their information. 
Then we have a web-based client, which is what the organizations are using to access the data. It basically acts as a unified inbox. It's continually hitting the database to get the latest reports. And, um, and then if you need to, uh, we'll be working communications capabilities into a uh, later version so that the volunteers can actually reach back out to those who are making reports. The client has three views. Uh, the, the volunteer can use the one that works best for them, a list, a map, or a gallery, access the specific reports that are going on, and then use that to dispatch field people out to the, out to the field to take care of the situation. And next up, I will turn it over to Kobe, who will take us through a demo and go over the technical lineup. Thanks, Steve. We'll be looking at a quick demonstration of our application, and we'll be viewing it from the perspective of a volunteer hotline operator. First thing I'm going to do is uh, log in. Username and password will get us in. And I'll be re redirected to the home page where I can view latest news, information, success stories of the conservation efforts, and then I, as Steve mentioned, I have three views. We'll start with the list view. And the list view will give us, pull all the information from the database of all the latest reports. You can see thumbnails on the left and we are organizing uh, by date time created uh, because text messages typically don't have a subject like you would in email. So we're using date and time. We have the body of the SMS that comes in. We pull the coordinates off the image. So we have a latitude and longitude. And because I'm viewing as a hotline volunteer, I get to see the details such as the phone number and status. And I can also sort by date and status or view the individual report, which also leads me to the capability to edit. If I would like to see uh, the information that we have in the database, uh, excuse me, yes. We'd like to be able to add text reporter and call reporter so we can stay in the same interface and call text or call back to the reporter. I can also see things in a map. I can scroll the map. I can zoom in on the map so I can see areas of interest. In this case, we're in the Virginia Beach area, which is close to where Steve is. I can click on a marker and I can see the same information within the map view as a pop up. And again, this information is being pulled from SMSs, and I can also go to the individual report where I can edit. And the last view that we provide is a gallery view, which gives you a visual representation of the images that are being passed in uh, as reports. This gives me the ability to do things like look for turtles that may have been tagged. I can also go in and edit the individual reports. So this is how the system was built, the back end is uh, Django based with a Postgres database, provides a RESTful API, the front end's React JS client with React Bootstrap and Leaflet JS. We're consuming uh, two primary third party APIs, SignalWire to handle test messages coming in and out, as well as OpenStreetMaps to display the map view. Although we are using Leaflet JS, which is a framework that gives us the ability to use Google Maps or Mapbox if we choose to. Additional capabilities we provide, uh, Nginx reverse proxy with Acme and Let's Encrypt is a fancy way of saying that we encrypt information between the servers and the clients. We have JOT-based authentication, so you can log in and out. And we also use automatic polling uh, to make sure we've got the latest and greatest information from the database. As Steve mentioned, uh, we are looking at continuing this effort. So we really wanted to focus on setting up a good foundation as a small development shop. So we focused on pair programming. We're using Docker containers for development and production uh, to give us a consistent experience, test-driven development using PyTest uh, with Django and Cypress and React on the front end. We're using uh, GitHub repositories and we deploy using a containerized system to digital. Uh, with this solid foundation, we're hoping our next step is to use uh, continuous integration deployment via GitHub Actions and Docker Hub. Our big lesson learned from this experiment, uh, Murphy had a lot to say about being able to pull uh, EXIF location information from photos shared via SMS. 
between iOS and Android devices, there are a lot of different uh, privacy settings, location settings. Uh, sometimes the data would get through even with the correct locations and the data was in the wrong format. So we found a lot of challenges and inconsistencies trying to use this. It all, uh, and ultimately found one phone out of six that we tested that could reliably submit the location data that we needed in the format that we needed it in. It all added up to a pivot required. And the good news is we have a few more steps we can take to see if we can't uh, get the location information the way we want it. Uh, the first one is to reply to the SMS asking the user to share, uh, explicitly share location uh, via SMS. Both iOS and Android allow, have features to allow you to explicitly share your location via text. Although we do feel there would probably be a requirement for many to have link to instructions, which could be done via YouTube video. Uh, or similar methods. We might possibly be able to use something like React Native uh, to develop a mobile app for both Android and iOS and possibly leverage other apps and services such as WhatsApp that allow for geolocation. Ultimately, we're looking to move towards a unified inbox and workflow, a single source of truth for conservation organizations who run a hotline, uh, possible integration of email, uh, voice while staying inside the web client, social media integration, and uh, all while balancing the amount of effort that it takes uh, to bring in additional reports and make sure it's validated actionable information. And we'd also like to look at uh, the ability to support multiple organizations with the same system. Uh, many of these organizations are cash strapped and we think uh, if we could re introduce report categories and allow a per organization workflow based off of category context and location, we could potentially spread the cost of development and support uh, across those organizations while providing an organization specific experience and even possibly break data out of siloed systems so we can start to see larger trends across geographic areas. That completes our presentation for Coastal Reporter. Steve and I are looking for partners to push this effort forward. Uh, if you would like to contact us, you can see our emails on the screen. Do I have any questions? Thank you, Kobe and Steve. Um, if you have, a, if you are in the Zoom, please utilize the Zoom chat feature to add, ask your questions. If you are one of our many viewers on YouTube, please utilize the YouTube chat feature, and we'll ask the questions via uh, that way. <clears throat> so our first question is from Zoom. It was mentioned that you'll be taking this project beyond Code Platoon. Will you be setting up an organization or website where we can follow up on your progress? So this is Steve. Yeah, I, I will say the answer to that is yes. Uh, we don't know exactly what it'll be. We've got a couple sort of parallel efforts that we, we likely will end up merging these into, um, but we'll make sure to keep the Code Platoon community uh, updated on where it is and, and where the latest information can be found. Thank you. Do, do we have any other questions? So have you considered using a notification approach? What pros and cons, um, if you have considered that, uh, or the pros and cons of like a notification approach? Yeah, I can take that one, I think, Steve. Uh, and I'm assuming they're asking more like a, a real time, maybe server push. Uh, and if that's the case, without being able to confirm that question, but yes, we are looking at moving towards uh, a real-time system, both between SignalWire and our server, as well as the server and the client. Um, so we'd have real-time notifications come, coming between all systems. And it is a, a feature that might, uh, for, certainly for a downstream in terms of pushing it out beyond the web-based client, you know, we could send text alerts, we could send um, you know, if we, if we end up partnering or, or having our own mobile app, uh, you can have alerts pop up in the app itself. Uh, so we, we specifically wanted this to be somewhat independent of the app so that people didn't have to download an app. Great. Uh, we have uh, a question from our YouTube. How are you managing feature requests and server hosting? Well, I mean, in terms of feature requests, uh, as I said, we will end up uh, 
consolidating this into some kind of website and we'll have ways for folks to make suggestions to that. And then, um, and we'll bring that in. And then the second part again, the second part of the question was? Uh, server hosting. Okay. Yeah, Kobe, I'll, I'll let you handle the hosting. It depends on ultimately how we set the organization up. Uh, I'm not sure if we're in a position right now to determine whether or not we're gonna try to make this open source or how that's gonna look. Um, I, I think ultimately we would be best served by finding a partner organization who's currently running a hotline so we can run a pilot and get uh, domain specific feedback to get the application where it needs to be before we roll it out to a larger audience. Um, but we're certainly interested in hearing feedback and ideas that people have because we think there's, there's definitely a need for this. Great. Thank you, Coastal Reporter team. <clears throat> if you have any other questions throughout uh, the, uh, throughout the, from here on out, please feel free to re uh, email uh, Steve or Kobe. But without further ado, I'd like to present our, introduce our next uh, presentation is Class Up. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Class Up. Class Up is the collaboration tool for students. I am Michael Whalen, and I will be introducing the team and giving a tour of the application's functionality. Our team members are Carol, who will give an overview of Class Up, Ose, who will describe the challenges that we faced during the building process, Jason, who will describe the technologies we used, and Adam, who will explore further areas of expansion. Let's get started with Carol for an overview. Thanks, Michael. Um, college students have to balance classes, homework, exams, job applications, internships, and maybe a few side projects. It is a juggling act of requiring great discipline and mastering time management. And now more than ever, the need for structure is very critical for the success as students are less engaged during remote instruction. And additionally, students sometimes face the challenge of not knowing what to expect from the, each class before being enrolled. So they need to check with other students about their course experiences to be better prepared. And our team can relate to these issues as we all experience similar situations while taking online classes. And many of us are now working remotely and relying on technology to actually stay productive while working from home. And therefore, we decided to build a web application that will be a one-stop destination to help students uh, work more efficiently and optimize their study time by scheduling study sessions with fellow students. This platform will also allow prospective students to access reviews for their next classes and set up group work even during social distancing. ClassApp is a tool designed uh, with the college students in mind for the sole purpose of connecting students keeping them focused and organized while being able to exchange ideas when stuck on assignments. It is a user-generated content platform that would allow students to stay engaged and succeed in their classes. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Michael to demonstrate the features available. Thanks, Carol. Uh, as Carol mentioned, a standard user of our application will be a young college student who's looking to work together with their classmates to succeed in school. Next, we're gonna take a walk through the functionality of the web application from the perspective of a new student, John Adams. I'll be John and I've used the application a few times. I've opened up to the login screen where I will log in with my username and password. I'm immediately presented with my dashboard where my profile information is, some national education news, and a list of upcoming events from my classes. Next, I can check out my personal calendar, which will show upcoming events like tests and study sessions. If I have any events occurring in the next 24 hours, I'll be able to see them in my notifications. Next, I'll go check out one of my classes that I'm already enrolled in, AME 301 Dynamics. From here, I can see and add both upcoming events and class meetings. I'm gonna create an event for a final biology exam coming up next week. 
input the title, start time and stop time, a short description. And then for location, we can put either a, a physical classroom number or we can put a Zoom link. Make it for August 21st. And when we hit create, we'll be able to see that the event has been added to the class view and also to our personal calendar there on the 21st. Now, since I was sick for my last class, I'm gonna go see what other students had to say about what happened. Other students have left notes and I can even add notes of my own. Input a quick description, decide whether it's gonna be text or an external file. And all we can do is drag, all we have to do is drag and drop a PDF or JPEG of notes that we've taken in class and hit submit. The notes are now available for any other students to view uh, and use. We can also leave comments or reply to other students' comments, things like, is anyone having trouble with today's homework? Or I missed today's class. Did I miss anything big? Now, if I just joined a, now I just joined a new class in real life, so I'm going to go join it in the app. If the class already exists, I can just hit the join this class button and I'll be enrolled. Otherwise, I'll input the class information here near the top. So Professor Washington teaches GW5243, which is History 203, and hit Submit. I'm automatically redirected to my enrolled classes where my history class shows up at here at the bottom. If I'm deciding in real life whether to enroll in a class and I wanna see what other students have to say, I can click on a professor's name and go to a list of all reviews that have been left by other students. If I wanna leave a review of my own, I can go to my reviews, select a professor from a class that I'm in and leave a review. I love this class. When we click submit, the description, the review is added to the bottom of our review list and also to Professor Breuer's list of reviews. And now that I'm done, I will log out. With that, I'll hand it off to Osei. Thank you, Michael. This project came with its fair share of challenges. Our first hurdle as a team was overcoming remote collaboration. The team had to come up with innovative and effective ways of communicating online within different time zones. Over time, we streamlined our communication channels, leveraging the power of collaborative tools such as VS Code, Live Share, Google Docs, Slack, Zoom, Git, and GitHub. My, Muro, Miro, and Trello. We shared ideas, paired programmed, traced our user stories, and tracked our progress to meet all objectives within set time. Our next challenge was coming up with a design concept. In order to attract a substantial number of students, class of developers put user experience first on the list. The team spent a considerable time churning out ideas on how components will react with each other. With the advice of a user, a real one, we were able to overcome this hurdle by listening to what is most beneficial for a college student in real time. The final challenge we faced in development was managing scope. As a collaborative tool, ClassUp could benefit from adding other external features. In order to meet the deadline, the team had to be realistic about which core features should be implemented to give students the best experience, such as calendar for each class and the ability of a user to upload PDFs and audio recordings. And now I'll hand it off to Jason to share some of the technologies which made this app possible. Hello. So our application is driven by two awesome frameworks. That's Django in the back end and React in the front end. Within the back end, we utilize Django REST framework for data serialization and Postgres for our database. In the front end, we um, the major packages that we use were React Router for page routing, uh, React Big Calendar for events visualization, and React Bootstrap as well as React Strap for styling. Finally, we maintain and manage all our code using GitHub. Okay, off to Adam for stretch goals. Thanks, Jason. So since most students' main way of communication is through cell phones, we'd like to make our app more mobile friendly. We'd like a way for users to view participants of a class, uh, search ability, which could be something like adding tags to posts and allowing users to search through posts with those tags or to search for posts by a specific user. 
and integration with Google Calendar. So that if a user adds an event, that event could be seen on that user's Google Calendar. Thanks for your time. And that concludes our presentation. Any questions or comments? Thanks, class up. Um, if you have any questions, please use utilize the chat feature of uh, Zoom or YouTube. <clears throat> uh, first question, to mitigate conflicts of many schools having similar class names, would there be possibility to add additional schools or allow users to search for their school? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, an easy next step to make those deconflictions much easier is to make each user enroll in a specific college uh, to separate um, so that you can only see professors that are in that, in that school, only classes that are in that school, uh, and each student will be assigned to a specific college. I think, it's, I think it's relatively uncommon for anyone to be involved in more than one college at a time, so that should solve that. Great. Uh, what feature was the most difficult uh, thing to, to develop and what specifically was challenging about it and how did you overcome that specific challenge? Oh, so do you want to take that one? Yes, uh, it would be, uh, I would say authentication because uh, we, we had to settle on a, a specific kind of uh, uh, a way to use authentication. We settled on a JWT uh, with a token and then we, we stored the token in a uh, local storage. We're thinking more wildly about how to verify authentication on so many levels, but uh, in order to limit scope and uh, hit the deadline, we had to be realistic about some of the things that we can do. Awesome, thank you. So another question from YouTube. Has the team reviewed their project with a college or university administrator to confirm no confidentiality agreements are being compromised? <laughs> I think we're firmly in the, uh, the space of information being, uh, I, I don't think we're infringing on anything here. I don't think it's anything more unusual than uh, uh, Dropbox or putting what time your classes are in on Facebook. Uh, we would consult an attorney if we feel that we're in a gray area. Awesome. So, so are you all happy with all of your tech decisions? Would there be anything you'd change if you had a chance to do it? Like if you had more time, is there any, like, anything you'd change from like a tech standpoint? Uh, Jason Rose or Carol, do you want to talk can, about uh, context? Or... Um, so uh, one major thing, I think um, these days, everybody works around Google Calendar. And that's like uh, Adam was saying, that's one of the stretch goals that we had. Um, and if we had more time, maybe a lot more time, we would be able to integrate that feature. It just, uh, with authentication, um, we, ha we had to push that out uh, as, a, as a stretch rather than pulling that in as a, a baseline feature. And just to follow up on that, uh, exactly what Jason said, also maybe uh, implementing uh, an API to Slack, uh, keeping being able to have students being able to show their status and work together also as well. So that would be something that we could have some kind of uh, external uh, connections to other platforms that they can share as well. Awesome. Our last question from YouTube. What was the code review process like for the project? We, uh, we made sure that um, anyone who submitted code for any portion was reviewed by another member of the team before uh, being merged into our final product. And we felt that was, that was important to make sure that things worked universally and not just on someone's specific machine um, and that worked very well. Uh, we, at one point were bogged down by having pull requests throughout the day and trying to get everyone's attention and merge things 
as they were. And then we set it so that at um, 1500 each day, uh, we would go through all the pull requests, deal with all the merge issues. Uh, that way it streamlined the process of uh, merging everything together. How many approvals did you need to actually merge? Was it just one other developer or was there multiple people that had to approve? One other developer for our uh, stage branch and two for going into the master branch. Yes, and for some of the specific features, uh, we required pair programming prior to actually pushing uh, one of the versions uh, into our stage uh, and before even completing a pull request. And uh, I just want to add one more thing. Um, towards the end, we did decide to um, try to take care of merge conflicts on our machines rather than on GitHub. So most of the time what we would do is once our branch was ready for a pull request, um, we would uh, pull, we would do a git pull just to update um, our original branch, uh, which was stage, take care of merge uh, conflicts on our machine, and then submit a pull request so that the, the um, merging portion on GitHub was a lot more smooth. Uh, can I add something to what Jason just said? Uh, before the code uh, became, uh, the code base became uh, a little larger to contain. Uh, I think we, we did have uh, initial ground rules about how to review. So in the beginning, we were reviewing us, the code uh, base became larger and it was easier at the end because we had reviewed all the code that was in stage, the main branch that was approved to be merged into the master. Great, our last question. What was the most challenging aspect of the project for each of you, whether it was communication, working in different time zones, merge conflicts, uh, or a, a, a specific piece of tech? Uh, for me, it was the visual aspect. Uh, I think moving information from place to place felt pretty easy, but then deciding uh, how do we present how do we present all this information? It felt like we were in agreement on what information to show the user, uh, but showing it in a, in a way that wasn't just text on a screen and boring, uh, that was a difficult hurdle for me. Uh, Carol's really good at it though. For, for me, I would say the user story portion, and I think some of the uh, teammates will uh, agree on me on that. Uh, it was not really uh, flushed out uh, as to how we will handle tasks under each user story. Uh, but as we went uh, went into development, we started understanding the, uh, the, the, the code process and the development process. So we started breaking down tasks more easily. And uh, it, since it was our first time, I think we had to get used to it. So uh, that, that was the most challenging part for me. Yes, I agree with the rest of the team. And also, as we, we pointed out earlier, authentication, uh, user authentication was a hurdle. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we had our amazing TAs and uh, uh, interns and instructors that were able to really help us through uh, some of these hurdles. So really grateful for that. Um, I would say for me, the the most difficult aspect was uh, uh, getting the notifications working um, because uh, it's like a, it was a multi-component state kind of thing and we hadn't gone over context before. So it was kind of learn on the fly and it eventually worked out. Um, I'd say for me, it was probably um... I guess re working remote because um, I wasn't, there was just times where I was, uh, like user authentication is really important for almost the entire project. And there was times where I wasn't sure if we were done with it or I would just hold off with what I was doing for a little while, uh, maybe work on something else while I waited for that to be um, done. And, you know, with, uh, with it, with everything being online, sometimes there, um, I didn't want to bother anyone. Like maybe they were in the middle of something right now. And if I had a question, it usually would wait a little while. But if it was in person, you know, it's a lot easier to just ask. 
All right, great job, class up. <clears throat> so our final group is going to be the garden party. So without further ado, take it away, garden party. Good afternoon, fellow students, instructors, mentors, guests, and all viewers on YouTube. We'd like to introduce our app, Planter. But before we do, we'd like to introduce the development team. I'm Aaron Wood. I'm currently serving in the United States Air Force and will retire with 21 years of service next month. My favorite plant from the garden is cantaloupe. Hi, I'm Chris. I served in the Marine Corps from 2005 to 2010. And my favorite plant is watermelon. Hello, my name is Daniel Lindbergh. I serve in the Marines from 2004 to 2012, and my favorite plant is the avocado. My name is Joel. I was in the U.S. Navy from 2011 to 2017, and my favorite plant is asparagus. And I'm Julian West. I served in the Air Force 21 years as an information technologist, and succulent strawberries are my favorite garden produce. Our web application, Planter, is a garden planning and scheduling tool for anyone wanting to grow their own produce. With USDA growing zones, thousands of plants to choose from, different times to seed, plant, transplant, and harvest for each item, getting started can be very overwhelming. Planter is for newcomers who don't know how to get started, as well as experienced homesteaders who want to streamline their planning and operations alike. A zip code is the only information Planter needs to do the work for you by presenting the most common items from 90 curated plants that will grow in your area in the current growing season. And as plants are selected, the list of suggestions dynamically updates, only showing what can actually grow with the remaining resources. Within a few clicks, the gardener now has a conflict-free schedule for the entire growing season. And now Chris will demonstrate the app. Hi, I'm an amateur gardener. My friend Daniel told me about an application that he uses to track his garden called Planter. I've navigated to the site and wow, already I'm really liking the look and the feel of this page. Okay, I'm gonna scroll back up and quickly create a new account and get signed in. Now once at the dashboard, I can immediately see weather details from my location here in Alaska. Today being a high of 57 and a low of 48. Now I'm gonna move over to the My Plants tab on the left. It is currently empty, which makes sense because I have yet to schedule anything into my garden. Okay, so let's check out the suggested tab. The plants shown here have been filtered down to only plants that can grow within my location. I really wanna plant some cabbage soon, so let me move back up to where the cabbage was at and let's check that out. Oh wow, it even shows me instructions for seeding, spacing, and when to harvest. This is perfect for me since I'm completely new to growing my own food. Since cabbage is what I want to plant, I definitely want to schedule this into my calendar. Uh, let's, let's check out the small plus sign beside the plant name at the top. And I'm prompted with a few choices that represent the earliest times available, named areas I can schedule my plan to. I'm just going to pick the first box and schedule it. And we can immediately see it's populated the calendar. Clicking on the schedule plant gives me some information about my date range to get my cabbage planted, the planting box I chose and some details when I need to come back and perform this task in my garden. Okay, I just wanna take a moment to double check that my My Plants tab now reflects my calendar and it does, great. And over here, there is also an all plants option for folks that may wanna grow year round in maybe a greenhouse or they may just wanna see some additional information on other plants not specifically in their area. And with that, I'm going to stop here and hand it over to Daniel, who has been using the app for a bit longer than I have. Thank you, Chris. I'm actually just finishing up my login portion right now. Once I click login, I'm immediately presented with the same dashboard. And as you can see, the weather is different down here in Florida compared to where you're at up in Florida or in Alaska. Also, I already have some plants in my garden that are staged out. This is my monthly calendar view. And if you notice, everything that was listed in uh, rows are now in columns, uh, separated out by the different tasks in the gardening uh, cycle. And going over to the right, you can actually see the final task and most gardening schedules of harvesting your plants. Moving over to the suggested plants, you could actually see that the plants vary 
drastically compared to where Chris is at in uh, Alaska. For those of you with a very keen sense of uh, attention to detail, you may notice that chili peppers are the only plant that we currently have in common between myself and Chris. Looking over at the My Plant section, this represents all the plants that are currently planned out and scheduled into uh, my garden. They might not be reflected over in the calendar as they're set for next month. Along these uh, tomatoes here in the west fence, I have um, basically some plants that are ready to be harvested, and I could have harvested them between July 3rd and September 3rd of this year, but they weren't quite ready to go. This morning I found out that some um, cutworms actually got into my garden and destroyed my crops, so I need to remove them from my calendar. At this point, I'll navigate back over to my plants, go ahead and click on the X, and it is removed from my calendar. At this point, I'll go ahead and transfer over to Joel, who will go ahead and explain the technologies used in our project. Thanks, Daniel. For our back end, we use Python and Django and the Django REST framework. And for our, data manipul our database manipulation, we use PostgreSQL. Our front end uses React JavaScript. And for the calendar, we use the Sync, function, Sync Fusion library. In order to tailor the weather widget uh, forecast to each individual person's zip code, we use the Open Weather API. And all of our styling was done with React and Bootstrap. Uh, we had to pull all of our information off of gardenate.com. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that faced us during this project. Uh, the biggest one being working remotely due to COVID-19 and everyone working remotely and having to maintain social distancing. It became difficult sometimes to make sure everyone was on the same page uh, regarding the app status. And this was something we overcame using Slack's uh, group call function to, uh, to stay in touch. And from that kind of arose another challenge uh, was our vision for the app. We have a lot, of, you know, a lot of people on the team and everyone had their own idea on how we wanted to start the, start the app. So we had to have a team meeting to get together and unify our vision for the app. And with this being, you know, a group, our, one of our first big group projects and using GitHub as a team, uh, we had some merge conflicts and commit challenges uh, that we ran into. So we had to implement a two person review system uh, to mitigate erroneous changes from uh, any merge conflicts. And then lastly, it was data sourcing was one of our challenges. Uh, it was difficult to find a database online that contained the right plant information and thorough care instruction that we specifically wanted. So we had to write a scraper and we went to gardenaid.com is where we pulled our information to seed our database. Now I'm gonna hand it off over to Aaron who's gonna talk about the stretch goals for this project. For the stretch goals of our app, we had a vision to integrate weather beyond a simple forecast to actually get details on when the last frost date was for zip code. Planning dates could then be dynamically changed for a particular user in their area. Also, allowing an expandable garden beyond four plots would give a user the ability to expand their garden. These goals would have been met with another few days of development time. For longer term goals, we'd, we would have loved to implement a mobile friendly design. To tie with that, alerts through SMS or even email are possibilities. So that's Planter. At this time, we'd like to answer any questions you'll have for the development team. Thank you, Garden Party. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, please again, uh, message them in the Zoom chat uh, feature or the YouTube chat feature. So we have one uh, question. <clears throat> so I see great contrast, which is certainly within uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, aside from contrast, what other considerations have you made for accessibility? Well, one of I guess the, I can oh, go ahead. One one of the uh, features that is pretty much required is a proper alt tags for any images. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Um, so what was the most challenging part of the overall 14 day project, whether it was a tech stack, whether it was uh, like for each of you, what was like the most difficult portion that you had to overcome? Uh, for me, it was the fact that we didn't actually have the correct data or uh, the data that was going to be actually utilized uh, until halfway through the project. So we were building 
features based off of data that we didn't fully know the format that it was going to come into. And then once we did receive the data, actually trying to change it, manipulate it, clean it up to actually be presented back out to the uh, front side. Uh, additionally, with the calendar and the front end being uh, React-based and utilizing JavaScript, they have a zero index-based calendar uh, date system versus uh, Django's uh, Python-based uh, date times with a natural number starting with one uh, for their calendars. So then having to convert a date object back to a uh, time zone aware date time object in the front end uh, presented a decent challenge. Yeah, um, I'd say I'd say probably the same thing as Daniel said. Um, uh, it was a it was a it was actually a rough start. Uh, we made a lot of assumption that the data would already be out there because it's agricultural. Uh, agriculture has been around for a long time. We figured the data was going to be out there. There's going to be APIs that we could already hit. Uh, until we started exploring all those possibilities, we we tinkered around with a lot of APIs um, and just try to find who had um, uh, which 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 uh, source had you know the best collection of information that we could use. Uh, and it was really difficult to actually find exactly what we needed. So um, we ended up uh, writing the scraper and collecting all that data and uh, ran it through a few scripts to clean it up and normalize everything the way we needed it. And then injected that into our own database so that we could have reliable information that, was, that we knew was there. So yeah, I, I think that was you know, the biggest hurdle because we, we did make a lot of assumptions on data that we didn't have. And that's, it, it kind of set us back a few days, I'd say. Uh, for me, um, the the back end work, uh, the database schema, and and kind of come up with out of database uh, seemed pretty simple. Um, and uh, I paired up with Daniel to work on that at the beginning. Uh, once it got to actually working the logic, uh, it became a bit more difficult for me. Uh, and so I, I I gained an appreciation for uh, front end work when I started working there. I felt I had a bit of an easier time uh, working on the front end. For me, uh, and, and apparently I'm not alone, it, authentication uh, took a lot longer than I expected. A lot of that was from, from React and trying to implement it in React. And uh, somebody mentioned context in React and, and yes. So I had to retool a lot of uh, reluctantly other people's code to uh, get authentication to work. And then that led to a lot of uh, the, the GitHub learning curve Joel mentioned and a lot of merge conflicts because there's so many PRs coming in and it really took, okay, getting that and getting all of us in sync and being smart about pull requests and, and merge and actual merges uh, and, and working smarter, not harder. And basically the same boat as everyone else, um, user, authentic user authentication and the actual data. It's hard to write code for something not knowing what data, the exact data you're gonna have. Uh, and that costs us time, like everyone else has already said. All right, our last question would be, what were some of the challenges when dealing with APIs and exploring which APIs to use or, or anything like that? Uh, I think a lot of false hopes. Uh, we would find different uh, databases. I, I think we actually spent the first two days looking for different APIs out there. Uh, and basically chasing down rabbit holes and finding out that, okay, hey, this database appears to be good. It's got a lot of hype behind it. There's a lot of uh, attention. Uh, and then when we'd actually pull in uh, just some sample data, it turns out all the uh, data that we'd received were filled with blanks uh, or nulls. Or, uh, so I, I think the fact that the APIs are out there, some of them are young and fresh and haven't been filled and populated with the data yet. And I think that was our biggest hurdles just testing and more testing of which APIs would get the data that we needed. The, the funny thing is there's a federal one that has like tens of thousands of, of these plants and their scientific names and all this other stuff that, that I don't know about because I'm not a botanist. And the funny thing is they're actually located where I'm living right now, like 20 minutes away. I, and all the fields that we were interested in were blank. So I'm, I'm actually thinking about paying them a visit. <laughs> Great. 
Thank you, Garden Party. <clears throat> this concludes the final pro project presentations. Back to you, Rod. Thanks, Tom. Uh, fantastic job, Lima Platoon. Those apps are really impressive. It's amazing what you can build in just 10 days, isn't it? Um, before we proceed to commencement, I'd like to thank a few folks. I want to thank Tom and Noah, our instructors, John, our director of education, and Merrill and Gus, our summer interns. They've done a terrific job teaching and supporting our students in this 14-week journey. Code Platoon, like everyone else, has been challenged by COVID. We have switched to an all-remote delivery of the program back in March, and the students, TAs, and instructors have done a remarkable job of adapting to the circumstances. And to the graduates, well, we're very proud of the work you've put in. Most of you've worked 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week for the last 14 weeks. That's no small feat. And looking back, well, 14 weeks ago, you were just learning the basics of coding. Eight weeks ago, you started building your first apps. Four weeks ago, you were wondering when the hell this would all be over. And, uh, and now it's over and it's ended. Uh, but it's really just the beginning of your next phase as all of our CP alumni will tell you. So congratulations to you all. Tom, back to you. Thanks, Rod. <clears throat> As Rod said, my name is Tom Preet. I'm the lead instructor here at Code Platoon, and I'm accompanying, accompanied by Noah. Hi, I'm Noah Heinrich. I'm an instructor here at Code Platoon. I'd also like to introduce our amazing TA interns, Merrill and Gus. Merrill and Gus. Hi, I'm Gus. I am, I am an intern here at Code Platoon and I'm a math and computer science student at Cornell University. And it's truly been a pleasure working with Lima Platoon this past summer. Hi, I'm Marilyn O'Shaughnessy. Um, I was also an intern here in a TA and um, I'm a junior. I'm studying mechanical engineering and computer science at Duke University. And I had a great time working with all the students in the course. Yeah, without Marilyn and Gus, uh, no one and I would have been overwhelmed uh, this just working remotely and everything. So uh, a tremendous amount of gratitude and thank you, Meryl and Gus, you made uh, this cohort uh, just that much better for just not my, not just myself or Noah, but also the students and staff. So thank you for that. All right, <clears throat> to close the Lima platoon graduation, we'd like to congratulate each student. So congratulations, <clears throat> Osei Tutu Amoban. Congratulations, Daniel Lindberg. Congratulations, Jason Pohl. Congratulations, Dan Whaley. Congratulations, Joel Setti. Congratulations, Adam Torres. Congratulations, Aaron Wood. Congratulations, Carol Wade Drago. Congratulations, Chase Thorpe. Congratulations, Kobe Lusky. Congratulations, Eric Murphy. Congratu Congratulations, Steve Wall. Congratulations, Chris Howell. Congratulations, Julian West. Congratulations, Kenesha Stills. Congratulations, Michael Whalen. And that concludes the Lima Platoon graduation. Lima Platoon dismissed. Great job, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Congrats, everybody. Well done. Congratulations, everyone. Good job. Thanks, Steve. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you all.